All right, friends, welcome back. Another episode of the Strong Life Podcast with my boy, Martin Rooney, who was the first guest ever on the original Strong Life Podcast, but there was no name to it. We were like, I don't have a name. It might be training for life. This, I think, is our third podcast together. And Martin, we've known each other for so long. When I was emailing you the link to Zoom, it was pulling up your email at Parisi School. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I've had a handful of emails since then. And man, great to be back. And, uh, yes. and hey, it's a testament. It's a testament all these decades that we've known each other that, hey, we're continuing to uh, do our best to help people. Staying where I, yeah, and I know so many people in this industry that are not in this or were in this industry that Correct. aren't anymore. And hey, so hats off for you for putting off great information all the time. And, and again, that was something you taught me very early. It was, and, I, and everybody listening to this, one of the things about Zach was always any communication you had with him was how can I help you out or how can I help you? And you know what, guys, as I was thinking about that before we did this today, that'll never fail you. Yeah, being, and I call it like, don't keep score. What would you do with your best friend, Martin, you know, Zach? I got a dead body in the back of my car. What do you need me to do, Martin? <laughs> Sorry, that was in New Jersey. But it yeah, wow. not yeah, like... that, that one, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so we have not had that conversation for everybody listening before. <laughs> They're going to be like, those, Jer those Jersey guys, I saw Martin in the Sopranos. <laughs> so the key is you help, but you're not keeping score. You're not like, Martin, remember when I did XYZ for you? You owe me. That's not a friendship that's not a relationship and even you know when i help you i get so much out of it i remember the day i went up to you in the parisi school when you were beginning the writing of the books training for warriors and i filmed and we trained we trained with rich we trained with your fighters and um the work ethic martin still is very uh, clear in my mind because i got there in the morning we trained through lunch and i remember uh, you did multiple workouts. I observed, I jumped in and I remember saying to myself, I think Martin forgot to eat lunch because <laughs> it was like a first workout. We trained with rich. We were like doing box squats, deadlifting. We call it like deadly dads, deadlifting. Yeah. <laughs> and then you were training with the fighters. Then you were doing some skill work with guys. And I was like, man, I don't think Martin realized he's missed his own lunch break. You were so immersed in it. And, um, that I think, you either got the heart and the passion to do this or you don't. So, you know, we're going to dig into topics of your new book, which is called High 10, correct? Yes. And you spoke about building culture. We met up uh, t three weeks ago, eh, actually a month ago at Summer Strong. And it's embarrassing. I didn't recognize you. You had the beard. <laughs> you were like, you were incognito. I hadn't seen you for I don't know how many years. And you're coming up to me to get the bro hug. And I'm like, your face is familiar. What's your name again? <laughs> well, hey, well, to explain for everybody listening. So, uh, hey, during COVID, which, and I want to still shout everybody out that has battled through this. And, we, and hey, the fight is not completely over. We're continuing to battle depending on where you are in the world that you're listening to this. But, hey, Zach and I, we travel, we present. It's it's in my blood. You just heard about the work ethic to do things. And really so much was removed from my life for this. I couldn't travel. I couldn't go present. I couldn't get to my training for warriors gyms. And it, uh, so I kind of went into a little bit of a protest, meaning, uh, I always kept a certain look. I always had to shave every day. I always had to do things. And I said, you know what, if I don't have to do these things and I won't. So I grew it's in Zach's defense. I grew a pretty big beard and now I grew out my hair and uh and hey it was you also yeah. had glasses so yeah. The whole, yeah so no one was recognizing me you could have pretty, mugged me you could have mugged me and I would have been like <laughs> that's kind of familiar but I don't really know <laughs> but I did go up to Zach and I was like hey man and he's like hey I'm Zach and I was like uh I'm, I'm Martin and he's like oh my god so it was Dude. that was like a highlight of the summer they would have that people. on film people which would yeah, we just kept laughing about we that but, but it is my fault because uh you know again it was just change you know just changing things up but during that process while my hair was also growing I really dove deep and wrote that book and so it wasn't that I 
didn't do anything. I did what I could do. And I was like, man, well, if I can't speak and present, well, I can still write. Why don't I try to create my masterpiece? And I think I, man, I really think I did it. It, it comes out July 7th and I cannot wait for people to read it because not only is it entertaining and are they going to learn something, but everything that's in there was needed more than ever last year. And it's needed more than ever as we come out of this about building a team and building a culture within your business or your, your sports team or your family. So it's going to be, I, I think it's, yeah. Mark, I need this book and I'm going to explain why as a coach. So I'm here at a high school, pretty big high school. And of course, then we've got my gym, but we've got a lot of coaches listening. And so what, and, and you mentioned things are still cl closed down. So um, Dr. Ken Kanakin emailed me a few days ago. Canada is still fully. Yeah, they're, lo they're locked down and our, yeah. our facilities have had so much challenge and, and a lot of countries through Europe too. So right. they're still, yeah. they're still closed. And so here's the situation slash scenario that I'm going to ask you about this year in at least the Northeast. I know down South, you're in, in North Carolina, so things opened up earlier, but up here throughout the school year, uh, we went to full days a month ago. So many schools in New Jersey were going half days. Then we had, I think, two closures. We shut down sometime, I think in October. Then we shut down in like early December when there was another spike. And so we had these two times where things were closed. So for my training in the beginning, I was only allowed to do the training outdoors with the athletes. So they got one dumbbell or one kettlebell and a mini band. Then, okay, you could go inside. It's getting cold, but only eight people. So now I'm missing the freshmen and the JV team. I'm training half of the starters. Workouts are 30 minutes instead of 45 minutes. Um, it was a mess. Then it's closed. Then the local gym is closed. So the kids were doing, then they couldn't do. And they honestly struggle, many kids, to do things on their own. This September will be our first time in essentially a year and a half where kids have a quote-unquote normal football schedule coming up. We're going to train this summer, which starts tomorrow. Uh, but I've said this to one of the teams I work with. They are the most divided team I have ever worked with. Um, kids show up late. Then they got to leave early. Then they got something else going on. Then they're going to a, a private coach and they don't want to train with the, you know, the team. And you don't really know, hey, does, can this, is this kid late because his mom had to leave in the middle of a Zoom call for her work or the dad had to? You know what? So there's been a long leash. And so now tomorrow kind of begins anew where the excuses are essentially pretty much gone. But I'd love to hear from your writing of the book and your experiences. You know, for as long as I've known you, Martin, you were working with pro athletes. You and I, quote unquote, met like through the Internet around 02, something like that. And uh, you were training guys for the combine. So you, you know, we are now OGs, but you're more OG than me. <laughs> so let's talk about this starting a new rebuild and the culture, because I've been saying this. We, not me. Um, how can you be great if you're so focused on yourself? There was a pro athlete, a, a real, you know, I don't follow football enough, but he was an NFL guy. And he said, the uh, you know, a Hall of Fame guy. He's like, the best thing I could have done was be a great teammate. So how do we rebuild this, whether it's in a private gym or a guy like me who's in also a high school and a big part of the high school strength and conditioning is building that culture. Yeah, well, hey, you, you summed up a lot of things there, and I think that should have resonated with everybody. So whether you train athletes, hey, my training for Warriors facilities all, all over the world, they predominantly work with, uh, you could say, adults from, say, 20 to 55, where some people might say housewives or weekend warriors, whatever you want to call it. And hey, I'm the track coach in town too. And I've been that for seven years. So I'm dealing still in all levels and then going and cornering. I cornered Jim Miller, who has the most fights at UFC in UFC history. I cornered him four times during COVID. So I got to experience the challenges that almost no matter where you are in fitness, you know, I was feeling it. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to say at first, it was not easy and it pushed 
both my leadership and coaching abilities to the ultimate test. And, and I'm going to say this right now, if anybody is still challenged or still anxious or worried, that doesn't make you weak. It makes you a human being because I don't know how a lot of people probably fought through this psychological battle of all the stuff that has happened to us as a, you know, as a result of, uh, you know, the virus, but, but through it all, what it showed me was again, like you said, the central piece of if it's your team, if it's your family, if it's your business, a central piece of it all is this word culture. And just like I did with the book, Coach to Coach, when I started speaking on coaching, I had to kind of define it first, right? Like, cause I knew being a coach was important, but, but what did that mean? Like, what does it mean to be a coach? How does a coach influence people? What is the role or title? Because when you go to school, you can come out and be a doctor. You can come out and be a lawyer. You can come out of school and be called a dentist, but you don't like leave school and get called a coach, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it kind of, you just kind of either go sign up and now you're a coach somewhere, but, but there isn't the same educational process. And that's what I tried to create with the first book. But what's funny is once you now understand what it means to be a coach, how do you coach for culture? How do you, how do you build that team? And that, is where I did the giant deep dive over the last couple of years. So it, you know, it takes a couple of years to write a book. So I was putting together everything I had learned for 20 years. And then when this all happened, it almost strengthened it all. But to kind of give everybody the picture, a lot of times when people say, yeah, culture, I get it. And then they'll say, okay, what does it mean? And then they don't really, again, have any working definition or any idea. And then I say, okay, do you, uh, can you imagine the kind of culture you want? You know, so for instance, with you, Zach, I could say, hey, the team's starting football. Do you know what you want? And you'll be like, yeah, I, I want the kids to be together. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll get a motto. Yeah, we want to be fired up in the locker room and nobody quits or everybody's supportive. And I'll be like, okay, well, how do you do that? How, you know, how are you going to create that? Right. And all of a sudden, people realize you, th you think you had no education for being a coach. Well, no, you know, they, man, nobody, I think people just get lucky, create neither a great culture or not. And you see it all the time. And, uh, and one thing I'll say right now, and then this should be big and then go back to you. Cause you said something great. One of them was uh, we versus me. That is, that no, is a concept we, in culture. We, we, not me. Yep. So there, take there, the focus off yourself and how do I make the guy next to me better? Well, you got to be a great training partner. Well, and here's one that I say in the book, which I think everybody will like, is then it's also, hey, you can't just be the best person on the team. See, I think everybody, like you said, we're divided now. Everybody wants to be the best person on the team. I, I got to be the best person on the team. No, if you have a great culture, every guy's trying to be the best person for the team, right? Oh. And that's like big breakthrough, but there, but hey, you got to show people how to do it. And here's why people can't do it. You ready? Watch this. So if I said to you, Zach, or to everybody, and this is something I say to all the teams I work with, I say, how many people here have been on a team before this? How many? And what do you think happens? Everybody. Every hang goes up, right? And I say, awesome. And I'll say, okay, of all the years you've been on teams, how many hours have you spent or how many people taught you about what it means to be a good teammate? And there's nothing. It's just crickets. Well, we're not educated even how to be a teammate. And it's not often valued. What, we, we, you know, what gets valued is like, hey, you're either going to be great and play or you're going to sit the bench. And it's people, we have not put that out there about how to be a great teammate and what it means to be a contributing person to a great culture and to be aligned. This is another whole section of it is, again, to be aligned with whatever the values are and the vision is of that team, which these are rarely conversations that we have. And I was just consulting for an Olympic squad and they didn't have any of that. And they, and because of that, they had all this division, they had all these challenges. They got a bunch of, bunch of divas slash rogues and it's Look, killing their, their culture. That's a common, I've, I've experienced that at the college level. I've experienced that at the high school level. I mean, I've heard of guys experiencing that in the special ops, in the military, wow. where lives anyway. depend on. So, you know, what do you tell the coach when you're consulting? This is how you bring them together, like gladiator, as one. I yeah. love that right there. He's like, we are better when we are together. 
And, you know, when they're fighting in that um, Coliseum, he's like, as one. Yep. That's well, what it's about. Well, and that's what, you know, hey, that scene is very powerful. I've referred to that before where what he did was he was like, hey, who's been in the military? And like, hey, we, we got to do this. We got to work together. It's not going to happen. He instinctively realized, you know, one of you is not as strong as all of you. Right. Yes. And, uh, you know, so ultimately, here's what I would say. When I first start meeting with any group, whether it's a team, anything else, and this is big, right? The finger has to go back either at yourself or if you're the leader or if you are the coach, it's your responsibility, right? Like, see, I see a lot of people point the finger. They'll say, oh, these kids suck today or uh, this kid's a nightmare or these parents are driving me crazy. And it's just kind of like, ah, like you are the leader. You are the one that sets the tone for the yes. culture and you don't even know what it is and, and you don't know what it stands for. And then you expect everybody to just either fall in line. So here's a great line that I use a lot too. And remember, high 10 is again, a parable. It's a story. So this is not a textbook. So for anybody listening, this is not uh, now you're going to read some boring textbook citing a lot of research, which, hey, all the stuff is baked in there but it's a story and it's an enjoyable story where you can really understand it and get through it. And, and that's my style. You know me, I, I tell stories and then stories within stories. the story. Yeah. And I think people, mm. I think people really enjoyed that as, and, and Hey, this is the sequel to coach to coach. So it's kind of like, it continues the story and takes it further. But uh, ultimately that, that leadership stuff has to, it is, so important. So it's kind of a leadership book. It's a culture book, but it really is all about starting to learn how to build either a team, business, or family. And the only reason I know it too, and I'll say this for everybody listening, the only reason I know it is because I've made mistakes in all of them. So I, I would love to be able to say, oh yeah, I, I just always been a good coach and, 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 and dad and husband and, and business owner, but I wasn't. And I, and, but every time I made big mistakes, it was because I was a bad leader or I didn't understand culture. And, and here's a bold statement and I'll throw it back to you. And with the hundreds of TFWs that were out there, the ones that not just survived, but kind of thrived during this whole year and a half were the ones that entered in with the greatest cultures, the ones that entered in that had the strongest relationships and they just kept going because all those people got behind them. There was leadership there. Mm. But the ones, the mm. ones that weren't strong, the ones that were weak to go in, those ones suffered. And, and you know what? That's probably what happens every time teams go into playoffs or teams go into right. championship rounds. Same stuff. Um, Jim Wendlers, I overheard him say this, I don't know, podcast video. Maybe we did had in a conversation. And uh, you and I have been friends with Jim for, you know, 20 years. But Jim said, before you point the finger, jab the thumb. And, um, you know, I've had these, I kind of get into these conversations with my own kids now. You know, uh, your kids are a little older than mine, I think. Or I know your daughter's going or going to Notre Dame or she is at Notre Dame. Yeah, so she's leaving for Notre Dame track and field, which, hey, that's a story in itself during this pandemic, but yes, yeah, so she's, she's 18. So I have 18, 15, 12 and eight. Yes. So my son will be 13 in a week and my daughter will be 15 the end of summer. So kind of close. So, you know, at that like teenage mark, when sports take this, you know, uh, acceleration into being more competitive, I do have to explain to them, like, listen, <clears throat> if you're struggling in a certain area, You've got to go out and find a way to get better at it. So, Ethan, if you're not hitting good, who's stopping you from putting a baseball tee out and hitting it into the net? Summer, if your backhand is not good in tennis, go to the park and hit against the wall. You know, don't blame other, other people. But I've had sometimes conversations with coaches where I'm saying, listen, my son, my daughter is young. I'm paying you to develop them and coach them and then they'll say things like, well, he or she's not good and da, 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 da. Well, have you said to them, this is where you are not good at. Here's the things you need to do. And then at 12 or 13 or 14, I look back, I was not very coachable myself. I wonder back then if a coach would have said to my dad, listen, here's what your son's got to work on. Now we get like some more communication. I try to communicate 
with the sport coaches and the parents. So sport coaches here at the high school, parents at the private sector. So sometimes communication needs to go in, I guess, these multiple directions. So I'm wondering, like, Martin, you know, we're talking about teams. We're talking about your own kids, training your own kids. What have been some of the ways that have helped you get them to be a better individual and a better teammate? How do yeah. we, you know, strategies, text, techniques? Well, here's, I guess it's, and I would say it's always trying to make things simple, right? Like don't make things more complex. Yeah. And it's really, I think, what some of the stuff we're hearing right there is, man, it's what do you value, right? Like, so first thing is like, hey, what is either that parent value or what is that coach value? And when I coached the high school team for track, some, we just had our, you know, end of the year banquet. And it was really neat because not only did I get up and say a lot about the kids, but then I thought it was over and then they got up and, a, and some kids said some stuff about me. Oh. And what was really cool is not only was it one kid was like, hey, I would never be going to this college if it wasn't for you and those extra workouts and what you put into me, which for that kid, I was like, dude, you got to value college and, and, and this is what we can do. And if your Thanks. performance is- Martin, let me just- extra workout you put in to me yep like yeah. okay practice is over at five bye oh and these were like saturday this wasn't even like you know this was like this kid. that's yeah. right there what i try to explain to other coaches if you want to be great it's going to take the greatest effort of your life to give yeah it's, things don't end if i'm coaching at my private from four to seven it's not over yeah. Things aren't over. All right, go ahead, bro. I yeah, got well, hyped up. I'm yeah. getting hyped up, Martin. No, well, you know, what's funny. You bring that up and I'm like, maybe in my head and hey, for everybody listening, that's just normal. Like I'm going to figure it out where, cause normal. I want that kid to do great. So I'm, I know what it's going to take, but see, there's one kid, but see with my daughter who already was doing great and we already knew she was going to Notre Dame. What I valued with her was her leadership. I said, buddy, this is your year. You're the, you're the captain. And you know, what's funny. You had said, like, I would say I was okay coachable when I was a kid. But what I always say is I was a bad leader. Like, sometimes I was, uh, you know, I guess one of the better performers. So I would be elected captain. And I was a lousy captain. I only cared about myself. Like, I didn't understand the role. The role of captain doesn't mean you go be the best player. It means you be the best guy for the team. And I made sure that I was like, hey, you're going to lead these kids. You're going to keep them this. You're going to lead the warmups. You're going to make sure we're cheering everybody on. If you see kids on their phone or they go up to, they're not paying attention. And I'll tell you what, she was all over it. And what I loved about it was, and I told her this, I said, you know, track is going to be over someday, right? It, no matter what, it, it's going to be. But those skills that you're learning, they never go away. And that valuing that, I'll tell you what, we had a cohesive team. The team had so much more fun. And in the four years I've been there, I've watched the culture change. But remember I said, one kid got up and said about the extra workouts. Yeah. This other kid got up and said, man, it, it was just so much fun. And when we always would get together and everybody be cheering for somebody, you would see them perform better. And, mm -hmm. and it was just, that was a culture. That was the thing I envisioned. That's what I wanted. And then I attacked it. So talking about keeping things simple, the first steps in this book, High 10, is really you got to give your kind of culture and your leadership a checkup. And then you got to decide, you got to really spend the time. So just like in Coach to Coach, you have to spend time de deciding what you stand for and who you are, and, and then you'll be able to make somebody else better. Well, this one is, what does your business stand for? Or what does your team stand for? And who are we? And then, okay, now this is what we're going to tolerate or not tolerate to make that happen. And it sounds so simple, but businesses, teams, companies, families, they don't do that, right? Like, so I ask a lot of people, hey, what does your family stand for? They got no idea. And the kids have no idea. And then don't, well, then don't be shocked when things go wrong. Or it's like, hey, what does your team stand for? And it can't just be, oh, I got a shirt. And the shirt says like, do work on it. Like, that's not like let's, enough let's, you know let's, they're let's saying um stand for something or fall for anything so when you mention stuff about like the gym i always say changing lives is the minimum effective dose and what that means is and how i explain it to our coaches is we are not just here to turn them into champion athletes 
And then this is where it gets a little tricky. And so I explained to them, I go, even if you don't have a kid out of my, the team of coaches that, uh, you know, with the underground strength gym, one is a parent, the others are not parents. So I say, pretend that it's the future and you step outside of your body and you're watching a coach train your own son or daughter. What do you want that coach to be doing? Is it just to be doing, you know, um, how to, you know, get a better start off the blocks or at the end, are we talking about putting in this effort into academics, putting in this effort into your work, into your life, carrying that, you know, commitment to excellence in everything that you do. And so that's one thing I felt has been a little bit missing from watching my kids get coached is I feel like it's just the sport. Yeah. And when I listen to you, I feel like when kids get coached by Martin Rooney, they're learning about life. And, I, and you and I are not saying we're the best at life. You said, I'm human. I've made mistakes. I struggle. But I want to see more of that in coaching. Because when I look at coaching, I don't look at just get you, you know, I don't want you to be a state champ wrestler, but you're, you know, you, yeah, your whole life's a wreck. You're, yeah, you're exactly. Mad. So... Well, Let's dig you into know, that coaching and, and, yeah. and, and what you're saying is it, it, we're all saying the same. We're saying the same thing here is DCL. You, what you just described is the culture of your business. And, and one of the things that it believes in that, Hey, we're not just here to build an athlete. We're here to build a person, you know? So, uh, Hey, if the kid's a better athlete, but he's worse of a person, we didn't, we didn't do what underground strength gym. I blame us. Do. I say, where did we mess up? Yep. Why, did, and, why is that kid? not doing the right thing in this area where did we go wrong when i look back and i've shared this before is we go wrong when we focus on them winning championship titles first and foremost and we're not checking in to see how are things doing at home how are things in academics how is life yeah. and so well and, well, and it's it, you're talking about building a a more well-rounded person. And, but, but again, it's, you see how for our conversation today, what I want everybody, the listener to hear, cause this is like, I always try to push areas for instance, like, Hey, speed training, you know, we were doing it when no one was doing it. Combine, Correct. we were doing it when no one was doing it. Yeah. MMA, I was doing it when no one was doing it. Yes. And then it was, I started presenting on coaching when I realized there wasn't any of that. And now it's almost like, my big breakthrough is okay. Now say, you know, the sports stuff now and the nutrition stuff. Now you have a business, but it's like, it won't succeed. If you don't understand, like you said, what do I stand for? What do I want to achieve? How does, how does this, how does every person in my business operate? How do they communicate? How do they exchange what my business means every day with someone else? And that, that exchange is your culture. You know, that communication is your culture that whether you want to call it that vibe or that experience somebody has. And you know what's crazy? And I'm going to say a bold statement that I say in there in the book. And it's and it's a theme and this should scare everybody. If you have not designed your culture, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't have a culture. I, I never came up with this stuff. No, you have a culture. All the people using your stuff, how it goes, it, that's your culture, whether you designed it or not. So what I'm saying is. Make sure you design it, not somebody else, right? And that's, what and that's what happens. Like, say this team, right? So you're starting football. And now imagine you like the kids. They, they kind of define it. And there's some bad, maybe there's a couple bad eggs. And now they're yep. doing some things. And then, you you know, maybe there's hazing. You know, think about it. Hazing was part of, like, the culture of certain teams. And if they never got told, we're not tolerating that. And if we hear about hazing, you're gone. Then they're going to do it. And DCO, you know, so here's another great statement of it is first one I just said was if you don't design your culture, somebody else will. Right. And that should scare you if it's your business or team. Right. But here's another biggie. You ready? Your culture will only rise to the level of the stuff you tolerate as a leader. Right. Like not, having a break the, not the crap you put on the wall, like you yeah. said, the slogan on a shirt. And yep. I guess, and it's not that that's bad. Like those are essential. Like I, I like I love the slogan stuff. Like I love it, but it, it's got to mean something, you know? And yeah. So here, like I just said, using that as an example, cause I've seen some crazy stories where, Hey, bullying, hazing, some of that stuff still exists. And you know what? 
coach is responsible. When it goes down, coach should be fired because you know what? They were tolerating that. This, and then the culture's bad, you know? This is huge because I feel a lot of coaches will just blame kids, yep. blame parents, but go back to what you're talking about. If you want to be a leader, you got to be willing to look at yourself first. Where did I go wrong? And I think that is missing. And I think it's, it's tough for people to say, you know what? I, I did something wrong here, whether you're a coach or not. And I think I I've shared this a bit and I've certainly, I feel it in our conversations, Martin, because I've known you 20 years ago before you and I were dads. And so we coached differently pre dad life. And, um, I just find myself at the end of each night saying, I got to get better. And, you know, I also say to myself, like, I feel like that's natural. Like you doing that extra work with the kid. You know what we call that at at my gym? We go, hey, guys, you're going to do some extra, extra normal credit. (laughs) Normal. And I feel the same. I'm going to do extra. That is the norm. And I've been kind of coming across a lot of this stuff where, Something goes wrong in sports and nobody wants to say, you know what? We effed up. We need to fix this. And this is how we're going to do it. It's always like, here's what you're not. Here's what this kid's not doing. Here's what your kid's not doing. What about you? Yeah. You're the leader. And if you want to be a coach, then it's your job to develop and be great. Not just, you know, there's got to be this feedback. And so I think you're right. If, um, I've said, I've been come, this has been coming up a lot. I did a recent podcast simply called do your job. And it was about a bad haircut that I got. It was about a bad experience at a restaurant. And um, I can't remember what the, what the other thing was, but it's about all these people that have roles, whatever their job or career is. And then they don't do it. They don't do it good or properly. And they blame others. And there's kind of this whole negative experience and versus saying, you know what, I effed up, I'm going to make it right. And it's weird that that I don't see or feel or experience enough of that. And uh, you and I both have certifications. Um, I created a new cert and we did a pilot uh, a couple weeks ago and I tried to condense it into one day and I did not do what I wanted to get done or what they deserve. And so I said, Here's how I'm making this up to you. I'm recording the next part. We're actually recording tonight. You will get that. You're going to get a month of business coaching. We're going to do like an intensive business call on Zoom once a week for four weeks. And I'm dumping every resource I have into them to make up for that day not being an A++++. I know you're like that, Martin. You and I are very, we're just high achievers. We don't like good. I always say good enough is the death of greatness. How do we get a coach slash leader. And if you're a coach, look, that could be the principal of the school. That could be, you know, an athletic director. It could be, you know, I mentioned, you know, in a podcast I was doing this morning, you work at the cable or internet company and you're in charge of people. You're a coach, you're a leader. How do we get people to stop accepting good enough? And you hear that in our industry, Martin, of listen, they're not like you. They're not going to be as good as you. I get it. They don't own the company and yada, yada. But what's, why is it so bad to say, listen, here's what greatness is. We're not doing good. That's crap. Well, and, and here's, here's how I'll answer it. The answer is almost in the question. Most people, because you said something really important. I wrote the word down, roles, right? You said, hey, they're not doing, playing their role. And I would argue that they, they oftentimes don't know what the role is. Nobody defined it at a really high level. So for instance, hey, this guy's not playing the role of coach. And like I said, but okay, has he had any education what it means to be a coach? Did anybody ever have him define what who he wants to be as a coach? Has anybody gone over that role? So it's like, you can't be an actor if you don't have the script. And hey, coach to coach was my, my kind of answer to that where, hey guys, you read this book, you're going to understand a little bit about better about what it means to be a coach, not reading just a book about John Wooden or, uh, you know, Bill Walsh and, and they're, they're talking about football, but you're supposed to figure out how to be a coach from that. That's impossible. Right. 
Well, the same thing. Hey, now your, your team isn't doing what it wants. Your business isn't doing it what it wants. Do you understand the role? Do you understand the role as a leader? Because, you know, I go to a lot of, I do a lot of, or I did a lot of seminars everywhere. One question I would ask a lot too, I'd say, hey, how many people here are entrepreneurs? What do you think happens? Most hands go up. Yeah, every hand goes up. I'm like, no, actually, probably 99% of you in this room are not. You're technicians, and, and that's okay. But right. see, you think you're an entrepreneur, but then that means you don't even understand what an entrepreneur is. And then when I explain what it is, they realize they're not. But the whole thing is they got the role wrong. So, hey, if you want to be a leader of your business, how about this one? When you had your first kid, did, did you come, come home with a manual, how to be a dad? You know, hey, when you got married, did you get a manual, how to be a husband? You know, hey, you became a coach. Did you get a manual, how to do that? You became a business owner. We don't teach people any of this stuff. Yeah. And then we're confused when they don't do it the way, the, like you said, the way we think they should do it. Right. So, so what I'm saying is, Anybody listen to this podcast, you're on the right track. That means you're hungry for information. You want to learn more. And Zach hinted at the best news. If you're a coach or business owner, parent, your job is to be a better person. It's to continue to evolve and learn this stuff. Now you're going to make mistakes, but the more you learn it, you're going to have a bigger impact as it goes. And, and that's been that's been my journey. Like I was a lousy business owner. Now I'm better. I was a lousy coach. Now I'm better. I was, a, I didn't know anything about parenting. Now I'm better, but it's because I keep trying to define the role. I keep trying to find out more about what the role is supposed to be. And I'll, I'll say this one, when this whole pandemic hit one thing that, you know what I have a whole lot less of, which is kind of ironic. I got a lot less fear. I see something that doesn't match our culture, I'm all over it. I see something in my house that doesn't match the culture I want, I'm all over it. You know, like uh, with my team this year, hey, here was the thing, like, guys, if you're late, you're not on this team, man. And you know what's funny? And then everybody's not late. But you know what could have happened? Everybody could have been showing up late and I just keep saying, man, these kids suck, they're always late. And it's like, no, here's our culture. We're not late. We're on time. We do the work. Here's what we're going to do. We cheer each other on. I had these like this Mark, handful of let's, things. Let's that kind of let's frame that into day one of practice, day one of yep. team. This is, you know, it's essentially a new year because yeah. we're starting. Hey, Coach Nooch, Coach Nooch, you know Martin Rooney? It's Coach Nooch. Do you know Martin? How are you? Good, man. How are you? Martin, perfect, used to be perfect timing. It was like you just came in right when we were about Nooch to jump has in. has been the head football. football coach how many years, Nooch? We're doing a podcast, by the way. So going we're in, live. Going into 24 years. Awesome. 24 years. So we're essentially talking about how this is like a new year starting tomorrow. School ends today. And so tomorrow I'm going to see them in the weight room. And now COVID here is, you know, technically they've lifted the ban. How do you start? You were mentioning be on time. Day one. What's yep. the speech to the team before practice starts? Do you yeah. go into, what does it happen? How does it absolutely, happen? Absolutely. So, hey, and having worked with so many teams over the years, so in particular, my big experience coach, at least in the football space, was with Wayne Hills and Don Bosco when, you know, which was pretty, you know, elite in New Jersey at that time. Still, still and, uh, and the biggest stuff was we're talking about culture today and really – setting the parameter for that. So, hey, the coach understanding that they are the leader, which I think they understand, but it's not just about making people do stuff. It's completely defining the culture that they want and not tolerating the behaviors that they don't. But the whole thing is those can't happen. Those can't happen if they're not completely and clearly defined. Right. And uh, so, hey, that those, and, and, and Zach, it's not just one practice and you got it. Correct. It, it's every practice till so you got the things, it, you know, like Martin, you mentioned, Hey, if you're late, you're not on this team. So yep. day one, let's go to like, let's look forward to day one of track with your team or you're the strength coach here tomorrow. What would some crucial culture rules that you would put in place from day one? What would you yep. feel? No, well, definitely, you? definitely. I already talked about that. Hey, punctuality, accountability. And then we had this thing, we called it, you know, cheer them on. And the whole thing is one of the skills, and you know, this from my uh, first book, one of the biggest skills I think a human being can have that we do not teach is how to get excited about somebody else more than yourself. 
you know, see, in this competitive Sorry. cauldron, if you yeah. will, everything's about beating somebody else and hoping somebody else does bad. That can't be something in your own culture on your own team. So the whole thing is, can you get a team that's so excited about everybody else, regardless of where they stand in the hierarchy? And if you nail that, if you nail that, those were the greatest teams that I was ever part of. And, and, I'll, and I'll be honest, I've worked with teams that had way more talent and didn't win. And then I've worked with teams that, man, they weren't that talented, but man, everybody did their job. Like we talked about, everybody knew their role. And even if they weren't the starter, they, they didn't care about being the best guy on the team. They wanted to be the best guy for the team. And man, if you can set that in place, I'm telling you, like what I always call it is that's where the cultural magic happens. And we've all seen it, right? Like we've all seen it. Hey, Michael Jordan, he wasn't really great for the culture. That's a famous story. They didn't win in the beginning when he was just a superstar. Yes. Well, when they, when they added a few other guys that brought it together, that's when they won. He you know, and you know, kind of the about, same stuff for he LeBron. Didn't care. He yeah. said he didn't care if he scored the points anymore. Yep. And now it was okay to pass the ball. Mike Schrock, who's down in your area, who's been coaching for like four yeah, years. Yeah. You know what he said he would tell the team? You just got to make one more play this year. All of you. That's what you're training for. Because if, you know, all of you are making one more play, that changes everything. And then somebody else, I wish I could remember um, who the football coach was, but he said the best teams I were part of, the guys loved each other. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, in all our success, the same thing. I mean, every year that we had a team that was hugely successful, you know, and like you said, take talent aside, talent does, you know, talent's one thing, but, you know, the culture of the team, the, the leaders of your team, all right, who, you know, go out there each and every day and play with the passion and, and it becomes infectious. You know, people yeah. start to, they see a guy like when we had no show Moreno here, Moreno took us to a whole nother level. You know, he, he took the entire program to a whole nother Why? Wow, what did he? Just the way he went about practice. Like, here was a kid who was you know, the most talented kid we've ever had. Right. But he played every snap at 1,000 miles an hour because he wanted everyone else to play that way. In practice? In practice, practice every what, day. What about when he was in the weight room? Did he... Same stuff. Same stuff. He he'd would go like... in the weight room, he'd rip it up in there, and you had to follow. Like, there was no, you know, you couldn't be the guy who didn't do what was going on. Like, what? Because he was setting the bar so high for everybody. Did he call? kids out versus you guys having to do it not as much you know but he didn't really need to because every day you know like you said he was working at such a high level that if you didn't work to that level you almost felt like you it was embarrassing to be around him like you didn't want you you felt like you were yeah i mean you felt like you weren't doing your job you weren't but, you know, but, you but you see how some, somehow you guys were setting that standard because hey i've had, we've had teams like that and you got a mega guy and it can go the wrong way too. Yeah. You know, yeah. meaning yeah. now he's so great and everybody shuts down because he's so great. So somehow there was some natural leadership going there, but at the same time, again, that comes from the culture and the coaching yeah. where, and it's interesting too. And here's something bold that I'll say. One mistake I think we sometimes make is we make our best guy, the captain, the best guy doesn't mean you're the best leader. You know what I mean? Just like I'll say this one. I haven't seen a lot of great football coaches that were the greatest football player, you know, of all time. And it's just kind of like, so the leadership, your guys are there. So our track team leaders this year, man, they weren't actually one of them was one of the slowest guys on our team, but he was like the best leader and everybody loved this guy. And, and he took control. That doesn't mean he can't run the warm up or he can't do certain things. So this is for every, and again, people are listening to this coach. So everybody listening out there, like, again, don't, I think we make the mistake like, oh, this kid's the fastest. So now he's the captain. And man, you're going down a slippery slope there. Cause you can be putting a really bad person, even though now they're athletic. And that shows what you value in your culture that, Hey, we value athletic ability above all. And we don't care wh what you do or who you are. And, and it's kind of interesting because this deep dive is not something coaches get a lot of education education in this is not something we were taught in school but we we learn it when we find that best team versus that worst team what my new book is trying to do is help people design it or engineer it instead of it happening by accident right and you see that so say you just said hey i've coached for 25 years here was a great team or here was a great team where man how can we up the chances of instead of two or three of those happen man maybe 20 out of 25 happen because we're leading them right. And uh, that's going to be the interesting stuff for the future. Cause 
man, you know that no sport I think has more, not only need, but the importance of culture than high school football, right? Having coached at college pro, it's harder to have that there. They didn't choose that. It's not part of who they are and they're fighting for themselves, but man, high school football is something a kid has. It's like the rest of their life. It's all they talk about. Yeah. And uh, if that can be done right versus done wrong, man, you can completely change people. And it comes back to the leadership, the coach and the culture. Well, so before new has to cut out, <laughs> we have a lot of like coaches who listen, sport coaches, um, strength coaches. What would be, you know, you're coaching a quarter, more than a quarter of a century with your other experience. What would be in the, if you're standing in front of a, a crowded room of coaches and you want to share wisdom with them, what would you tell those coaches are important or is important? Nope. Every, every, like, like you're saying, I mean, you, you have to be able to go in and, and set the tone right away. I mean, what is it that you expect from your players? What is it that you expect from your program? You know, our, our program, and like many other programs, we talk about, you know, legacies and we talk about championships. You know, we don't necessarily, like, you know, Alabama doesn't do much of that. They don't talk about championships. There's no signs in Alabama's locker room about championships. And Saban's not, you know, he's not doing all that stuff. For us, we want to make sure that, you know, number one, you know, our program, we want it to, to be respected, obviously, like everyone else does. So we have to instill that in our kids. You know, we got to make sure that they understand that, you know, that playing for us is, you know, is a privilege. You know, it's you when you put that helmet on your head, you wear our logo and you wear our uniform. You represent your family. You represent our school, our community, yourself, you know, all the stuff that we talk about. So we want to emphasize all that stuff. And we talked about it last week in our team meeting. You know, we there's a there's a, uh, you know, a standard that you set each and every day. You come to practice and we go to work, you know, and we work for, you know, we, we punch the clock just like everybody else does. And at the end of the day, we punch the clock out. And the next day we come back and do the same thing, you know, and we got to get what we can out of our guys when we have them, you know, and all we ask is for two hours and 30 minutes of focus, you know, every day. And hopefully, like you said, we find some leaders that can help us lead and we find the guys that can help us win. And ultimately that's the goal. Awesome. I think part of it is too, is like the coach has the role, you guys are out there playing, so you've got the work to do, you know? So you mentioned earlier, hey, it's can't point the finger at anybody. We're all pointing the finger at ourselves. Well, so, and, hey, and one bold thing I'll you. say too, Coach, just so we don't forget it, is, uh, hey, you know who the most important people is you got to coach? It's all your assistant coaches, you know? And if you can keep that, you know, hey, because that's one I've seen too. The head coach has this philosophy and theory, but then you see a bunch of, these other guys and they don't get it. So never forget. And Hey, taking it from a business perspective, because we only talked about say our clients today or our athletes, Hey, it's our staff. And man, one of the things, you know, cause I got to work with coach Olson for so long up at Wayne Hills and uh, coach toll. And, and, and I'm from Sayreville originally too, which is neat. I'm in North Carolina now, but when I hit, you know, so I'm very familiar with no and everybody else. And uh, it's interesting that the top coaches would always say, the most important thing is that I have this great staff and then they are all on board with exactly what we're doing. Cause then I don't have to keep, I don't have to spend all my time, keep training new staff people. I'm keeping them going. So for everybody listening to the most important people that should get your culture, isn't the athlete or your client or your gym member, man, it's the people that work with you and for you. Cause man, they're the ones also delivering it. That's every like day. And working every in day. a school, your yeah. principal, <clears throat> he or she sets that, you know, sets that tone. And if you got a great principal, the teachers and the coaches are excited to be there. So I've been in many different schools and I've experienced how we could have, you know, a different principal, their energy kind of transfers into the teachers or coaches in a good way or a not so good way. And, yeah, exactly. uh, and that's leadership. And, and again, we don't get taught it and it, but if, you know, but now Henny, anybody listening, you got to start exploring it. So I'll challenge everybody. How many books on leadership have you read? How many books on communication have you read? Behavior modification versus you're reading another book about the X's and O's or you're reading another book about like exercise. And hey, that's great, but that's going to fail you in the end. Cause you know what? The best teams, it doesn't have to be that complex in either of those areas if you've got incredible leadership and incredible culture. And, uh, and so it's neat, right? Like this isn't something I talked about 20 years ago or 15 years right. ago or 10 years ago, yeah. but now it's the deep dive. 
And coach, what we were talking about is with the pandemic, holy cow, we need it more than ever. Cause like people are not only losing their minds, but it's just, nobody's on the same page. We're divided. There's just so much division and it's just, how do we reel them in? We got to make them part of something bigger that they're really excited about and they understand their role, how to be part of that. And, uh, and that's where I'm spending my time now. Cause I'll tell you what, like sports is the greatest vehicle to learn all the stuff we talked about, but it can also be the most damaging thing that ever happens to somebody in their life. And I either get that one of those two stories. I'll talk to somebody, Hey, Oh, you played football. What was it like? And it's either, man, it was the best time of my life or it was the worst time of my life. And somehow we went, somebody went wrong there in that leadership spot as a result of that. And Hey, if we, you know, and now we're going to be under the microscope more than ever for it as this first season, you know, reemerges after almost a couple of years. So, you know, really excited about where it's going. Yep. Martin, tell, so, yep. Thanks for coach, coach Nooch popping in. I love it. Martin, thanks love for it. the time, man. Hey, my Nooch. pleasure. Good luck this year too, coach. Yeah, brother. Thank you. Yeah, we've had a crazy year, but we've been able to train all year. So I'm excited for this. So Martin, for the people listening, just show, uh, you got the uh, image, the cover of yeah. your book and is it, it's on pre-sale on Amazon. Yeah. So right now the book is called high 10 yep. and it is, uh, it, it will release. So depending on when you listen to this, it'll already be out the first week of July. So we're only a couple of weeks away. I'm going to get this out this week. So yeah. they'll have a chance Perfect. to pre-order. Perfect. And what I'm doing is a, this really big pre-order special. Zach, we did this last time and a lot of your audience took yes. action. That's why we're excited again. And here's how it works. Hey, if you want to just get the book, get the book. It's on Amazon right now. But here's what I'm challenging everybody. Your first step to build culture. If you, I call it get one, give two. So you either got a family member, you got a friend, you got teammates, you got staff. So if you get one for yourself and two for two other people to give as a great gift, here's how it's going to work. So if you buy three and you send me the receipt to martin at coachinggreatness.com. I'll so link buy it three, Yeah. So if you buy three, send me the receipt. I'm going to send you two uh, PDF culture documents, two bonus chapters that you can already start reading that are going to be essential to the book, which are really cool. But the biggest is, even if we hinted at it today, I have an 80 minute talk that I gave about culture that's going to match so much in the book. It's one of my best speeches ever. It cost over 500 bucks to attend the event. You get that too. So you get a book, give two as a great gift and start building your culture and you get over $500 worth of stuff if you do that. And all you got to do is order it and send me the receipt. But um, that offer is only until July 7th. Then when the book releases, we're going to do something different. So gonna, that is the we will get it out. offer. And I'll tell you what, I could. this one is my best yet. If you're afraid of reading books, don't be. This is, it's a story. People blow through these books the way I write them, but they're never the same. Yeah, and our uh, listeners are not, they're not going to be scared or afraid to read. <laughs> I've been saying this a lot is like, I've, I'm always trying to get better at the coaching skills of stuff. But if you can't create that culture within the weight room or wherever it is that you're coaching, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is also why I think some of the best technician strength coaches cannot run a business. They don't know how to bring the people together and create that culture. It is crucial. Or, you know, what if you're not a coach? What is the culture in your family? <clears throat> and that's, that's crucial because as a family man, you have the ups and downs, you go through the tough times. Um, but if you have a clearly defined culture, what your role is in the house, you can lead through those tough times. So super excited, super important. What's the email again, Martin, to send the uh, uh, receipt to? So it's just martin <laughs> at coachinggreatness.com. Perfect. And, uh, you know, and hey, Again, Zach, this has been awesome. Hey, we had a we had a guest guest visitor right there, That's which amazing. Coach, a lot you. of our stuff. Quarter century of coaching, and hey, yeah. everybody. Hopefully, everybody enjoyed this. Let Zach know we'll do another one if you did, because there's so much more to cover. But today, the whole thing, just to summarize, is if you haven't even thought about that word culture and what it means, then man, somebody else is probably designing yours, and you have a culture, you just haven't designed right. it. And if this got you interested, the new book will show you how to do it. Nice, nice. So everybody, big thanks for listening. 
or watching, if you are watching it on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, like, and comment. And then, of course, if you're on uh, Apple Podcasts, leave a review and uh, pick this pick this up on Amazon. I'm going to gift it to my coaches as well. So I'm pumped up. Martin, stand by, my bro, as I shut this down.